All right. Uh, if you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to Psalm 19 once again. Uh, we've been looking at the ways that God has revealed himself. And the first six verses of this psalm uh, talk about how God has revealed himself through that which he has created. So that every human being should know that God exists, should know that uh, God is real just by looking around you at the sun, the moon, and the stars. And the, In fact, Jesus himself said, if you don't praise me, even the rocks will cry out. And the rocks indeed cry out the existence of God. But this morning, we're on the verse 7 here of this psalm, and uh, we're going to look at an even greater way that God has revealed himself. And I've titled this message, God Has Spoken. If there is a God, and if God does exist, then what are the evidences for God's existence? I believe the greatest evidence that we currently have is the Bibles we have in our laps. That this is where God has spoken to you and me. He has revealed himself to human beings. And the book you have in front of you is not just a spiritual book, it's a history book of what God has spoken and what God entrusted to the church of God 2,000 years ago. What we are called to hold forth as the church of God is the people of God, is what God has already said. It doesn't need adding to. It doesn't need taking away. Because it's a perfect revelation of who God is. We can't improve it. And we shouldn't try to improve it. Neither can we in, in reality diminish it if we break it open and study its contents. We will discover God speaking to us on a personal level through its pages. We will discover not just a general message to all of humanity, but we will discover as we continue on a personal message to our own heart and our own soul of God speaking clearly to you and me. This is the book of God, the book of books. And though indeed we don't worship the book itself, we worship the God who gave us the book and we use his book for his glory. There is no other book like it. No other book that is an infallible source of revelation and truth. An infallible source of how you and I are called to live. An infallible source, a trustworthy source of how you and I are called to worship God. You will not find a greater revelation of who God is except in the book that he has given over the centuries. You and I have been entrusted with this book and we need to be faithful to the book. We need to be faithful as a church and faithful in our own lives with it and in the study of its contents. Now we go here to verse 7 and this may take more than one sermon so be warned. I broke up in verse 7 and I thought man there's a whole sermon right here. But uh, first of all in Psalm 19 verse 7 what is described here is the perfection of the law. You will understand that sometimes in certain contexts when the law is mentioned, uh, what David is covering here is covering the whole law or the whole um, revelation of Scripture that was revealed to him at that particular time. Now if David in his era, who had the laws of Moses, you know, and he had the book of Joshua, and he had judges in front of him. If David could say this about the impartial, incomplete book that he had at that point, that it was perfect, then how much more can we say it's perfect now that we have the whole book from Genesis to Revelation? The church today will stand or fall and will only be as strong or weak on how we stand on the book. We either preach Genesis to Revelation or we'll end up preaching something of no value and no worth in the long run. We are not here for, to improve ourselves in a self-help sense. We are here to find God and we are here to find God in his word. 
And we are here to hear God speak to us through his word. We can't alter what God has said. We can't water it down, diminish it in any way. And here, the uh, first description of the Bible is that it's perfect. Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. Do we believe that this morning? I hope we do. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Now, I read that from the King James Version. And I can understand it from the King James Version, but there's a change, a slight change of wording if you were to go to a more modern translation. And we're going to cover this in a moment. Uh, but I just want to mention this in passing before I enter into it in, in, in a more stronger way. Um, the King James talks about the conversion of the soul. How many of you know the Bible has the power to convert the human soul to God? Only the Word of God can convert your soul and turn your soul around to get to know this God in a saving, salvation, forgiving, redeeming sense. When God uses his word to speak to us. There are moments when we read the Bible, it's like it's not speaking to us, and we're reading it and reading it and reading it, and all of a sudden as you read it, something just hits your heart, speaks to you on a personal level, and that, my friend, is the Holy Spirit taking the word of God and communicating God's word to you through the Bible. And it's a beautiful thing. But I can remember first reading the Bible. I was 18 years old at the time. Didn't know who God was. Mentally tormented in my soul. And I never read the Bible before. But as I broke open its pages, there was a conviction that came over me that the words that I were reading were what were, were, was true. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That makes sense to me. Read through it, read through it. Some of the Bible was very painful for me to read. But I read through it, read through it, realizing that what was going on in my life was, 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 a, was a spiritual thing and there, there could be no natural solution for a spiritual problem, you know. And as I began to read the Bible, I began to realize, unless God helped me here, I have no help at all. And uh, to cut a long story short, the Bible was used by God to convert my soul to himself. And I was converted by the power of the scriptures. The Holy Spirit took the scriptures, convicted me of my sin, showed me the reality of who God is, and showed me my true condition. It, I can say this, God used his law to convict me. I could say with the hymn writer, by God's word at last my sin I learned. You know, and, and I did, till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary, you know. And there is a message in this book. Um, and until we get to the cross, we will never be free, you know. We can read about the law, which is good and holy. And I discovered that I'm not good or holy, far from it. And uh, I couldn't change myself. I couldn't change my own um, condition. But it wasn't till I came to Calvary, it wasn't till, you know, I discovered the cross that I was truly liberated in my soul. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. There is converting power in the Word of God. Only the Word of God can cause your spirit, your soul to, to be regenerated, to be born again. Um... But notice this as we read the next, the ESV translation. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Uh, New American says, restoring the soul. How many of you know that when the word of God converts the soul, that's just the beginning. It's a beautiful beginning. It's a marvelous beginning. It's the greatest miracle that could ever happen to you and me when the Holy Spirit takes the word of God and instigates the new birth within us and penetrates us by the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But you may rest assured, the only thing that can sustain your new birth existence is the very thing that brought you that new birth in the first place. 
So in other words, the same word of God that converts the soul is the same word of God that keeps the soul revived. The same word of God that converts the soul is the same word of God that restores your soul in time of need. And by golly, the Lord knows how desperately you and I need the word of God. Where would we be without the word of God? Consider for one moment the absence of the Bible in your life. If you never had the Bible in your life, where would you be? We shudder to think. It's a great gift from God. It's a wonderful messenger of God. And this is where we do hear God speak. The law of the Lord is perfect. Let's go back to the claims of Scripture itself now. But I'm laying a precedent that what we're going to look at is the conversion of the soul and the reviving of the soul through the Word of God. But let's go back to the, to the first line here. The law of the Lord is perfect. The word perfect here is taken from the Hebrew word tamim. Tamim, and it means complete, unscathed, intact, whole, entire. So we could say the law of the Lord is complete. Amen? Genesis to Revelation. My friend, if you think you need more than Genesis to Revelation, you're not really grabbing a hold of what the Bible really is. Come on now. Um, if we lay aside this Bible and we seek other sources for truth, we will go astray. Jeremiah 17.9 warns us that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? My friend, the only way we can stay on track is holding fast to Scripture, the Word of God. So the law of the Lord is perfect. It's complete. It's unscathed. It's intact. It is whole. It is entire. The longer I'm in this, the more I am convinced of this reality that Genesis to Revelation is sufficient and more than sufficient to sustain you and me throughout our entire Christian life. This is all we need. It really is. Amen? Uh, you really don't believe that. I can tell by the way you're saying amen. Come on now. Amen. That's better. Praise God. Not that I'm looking for, you know, cheerleading per se, but it's good that you agree with what I'm saying this morning. The Bible itself gives, gives testimony to itself that it is sufficient. And uh, so first of all, the, Lord, the law of the Lord is perfect because of its source. Um, it is true that God used human instruments to write down Scripture, but those human instruments were marvelously picked and pre-chosen by Him and the circumstances that they were aligned in. You see, it's amazing when you consider how Scripture was put together. Um, you, you know, you can read the life of Moses, the very first author of Scriptures, of, of, of the first five books of the Bible, and his whole life is written down and documented in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. And what an amazing life he lived. 120 years old. Um, his life is separated into three 40-year periods. You've heard the saying, life begins at 40. Happened three times for Moses. First 40 years, he was prince. Second 40 years, he was in the desert. The third 40 years, he was a deliverer. Amen? The deliverer for Israel. And three facets of his life. But you see how God prepared that man. How God lined him up. How God worked in his life. He was the first human instrument who God used to write the first five books of the Bible. Consider that for a moment. Moses saw things that you and I have never seen, right? Yet we can enter into what Moses saw because he left it in writing. He was commanded to write. Amen? Amen. It's on record. It's on permanent record. I don't know Moses. I've never met Moses. Yet I met Moses through his writings. And I've, more importantly, I've met the God who Moses declared through his writings. You see the power of Scripture? God has chosen through words to make himself known. I've often wondered, God, why didn't you do a picture book? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, I'm a, kind of a picture guy myself. I need illustrations, diagrams. 
But God didn't choose to declare himself that way. He chose to communicate the, the reality of who he is by words. Amen? Jesus himself, he majored on scriptures. And he encouraged people that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And Jesus himself did not sit down and write Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But it's amazing how the words of Jesus were recorded by his hearers, written down, and what magnificent words they were. Think about it. If even his enemies returned and couldn't arrest him and said, no man spoke like this man, is it no wonder why the words of Jesus were recorded in the first place? Amen? Amazing. Now, let's go to 2 Timothy 3.16. This is really important, guys, because if we're looking for truth, we need to go to the right sources, and we need to trust the source that we're going to. Um, we are living in a day, nothing new, that the enemy is trying to come against the Word of God. He's trying to debunk the Word of God, come against the Word of God, because if he can convince you that the Word of God isn't the Word of God, then where else are you going to go? Right? 2 Timothy 3.16, let's, let's go there. Let's go there, 2 Timothy 3.16. If God has spoken, where has God spoken? Genesis to Revelation. Genesis to Revelation has been accepted for 2,000 years by the church. Prior to the church, the Jewish people embraced Genesis to Malachi. And we just, that was just carried over into the church. So we have an amazing book in front of us. And so Genesis to Revelation, we can say this with great assurance this morning, that all Scripture, when the Bible says all Scripture, the Holy Spirit has in mind here Genesis to Revelation. Amen? All Scripture. We, we want all of it. Amen? Even the genealogies. How many of you love the genealogies? There are times I'm reading the Bible, and then in my own human wisdom, I'm like, God, why did you cause it to be written this way? And you know what I'm saying? Um, I'm a kind of a chronologically thinking person, and it's like, why didn't you just put everything in chronological order? Well, how many of you have ever seen those chronological Bibles that they've come out with, that they've tried to sequence everything in order? That's even more confusing than Genesis to Revelation. Are you with me on that? It's like, how do you know that happened then and then and then uh, in that sequence? Some things we do and some things we're not sure about. But God chose it to be put in the form it's in. And we should trust that, that um, reality that it's in. But it says, all scripture. Now, the ESV takes the Greek word, theonoustos. And uh, the NIV says, God breathed. But I actually like this when it says, all scripture is breathed out by God. Why does the word of God revive us? Because it's been breathed out by God. Amen? When I'm lifeless and I go to scripture and my fire is burning low, and I, and I return to the scriptures, because this is an accurate description, scripture has been God breathed or breathed out by God, then when I read the scripture and I embrace the scripture, it's like God is breathing into my very soul. Amen? It's full of his life. It's full of who he is. The scriptures will always be alive as long as God is alive. And God will never be dead. All scripture is breathed out by God. It's got God's life in it. So you, my friend... And myself as well, devote your life to the Scriptures. Get to know God in the Scriptures. Get to know God in the Word of God. If you've been neglecting your Bible, it's time to stop it. Don't beat yourself up about it. Just do the right thing today. Just say, hey, with God's help, I'm going to devote my life, the rest of my life I have, however it may be, to get to know this God through the scriptures that he has given to me. And my friend, the lack of spirituality can all be traced back in our life to a lack of devotion to the scriptures. You say, well, I'm not a Bible teacher. You're a believer. The Bible was written just as much for you as it was for me. And if you want a relationship with God, 
it's vital that you tap into the Word of God because that is where God will speak to you. You know, God wants to speak to you. He wants to give you a relationship with Himself. He wants you to know the Bible, to understand the Bible, even if you may never be a preacher. It's okay. He wants you to know the Word of God because He wants you to know Him. And I think one of the biggest lies out there is, well, the Bible, you know, it's not really for everyone. We'll just come and listen to a preacher and he'll explain it to us and, and then we'll go home till next Sunday and uh, we'll crack open our Bibles again. That, my friend, is not Christianity. Christianity is give us this day our daily bread. And God will speak to you in a way that I cannot speak to you because he's God. So if you've been neglecting the Bible, pick it up. And if you've been trying to clean up your life first before you read the Bible, forget it. That's not going to happen. Come as you are. Let, let the Bible, let the Word of God wash and cleanse you. You're, you're running on empty. You're trying to clean yourself and then come to Scripture. Don't do that. Come to Scripture and let the Scripture wash you. Let the Scripture cleanse you. Let the Scripture renew your mind. Let the Scripture transform your way of thinking. Let the Scriptures look at your situation and cause you to view it differently through the lens of the Word of God. We desperately need to become a people of the book in these times. God has granted gifts in his church to help us understand the Bible. I'm not saying that, but those are gifts from him. And we're still trusting in him if we use those gifts correctly. He gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, you know, and, and, and teachers. He gave it. Jesus gave it. And uh, so we trust Jesus through that as well. But that's no replacement for you getting into the word for yourself. All Scripture is breathed out by God, and it's profitable for teaching. You will be taught for a proof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Do we believe this morning that the Bible is the fully inspired Word of God? Do we believe that this morning? We believe that. Now, here's a warning to this thought, though. There are many people who claim the divine inspiration of Scripture but by their practice deny its inspiration. What I mean by that is, if we believe in the full inspiration of the Bible, then the second reality is that then we must also believe in its sufficiency. In other words, if I believe the Bible is the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation, then, it, then, then, then I've got everything I need in Genesis to Revelation to tell me all I need to know about God, right? This is where the church breaks down because on many of our doors today we have we believe in the full inspiration of scripture we believe in its infallible truth but then when you go in through the doors the word of God isn't taught the word of God's not preached the word of God's not proclaimed it might be mentioned in passing and it's replaced with just good old fishing stories and you name it and uh, I'm not saying we can't talk about, you know, our lives or anything like that. But the Word of God should continuously be central in our thinking and in our time of worship. And uh, if we believe the Bible is the fully inspired Word of God, then we should seek to speak. If anyone speak, let them speak as the very words of God. We should seek to declare Scripture. And we should seek to lift Scripture high and trust that, Scripture is sufficient for all that we need. My friend, I can't meet anyone's need. I can't even meet my own need, let alone anyone else's. But the Word of God is sufficient to meet whatever need we have in this place today. Now, this is where verse 17 comes in. You see, and this is where there's a breakdown. Wherever there's a doctrinal breakdown in the church, it's like a contradiction in terms. It's like people are saying, well, I believe the Bible's the inspired word of God, but then they, they make it a secondary thing in the church itself. And it, but it, when you read verse 17, not only is the divine inspiration of Scripture taught in the first uh, 
in, in verse 16. But now we go to verse 17. The sufficiency of the scripture is now declared to us. Um, so if we want to be more complete and we want to be equipped, then the word of God will be the way that God equips us. He says that the man of God may be what? Complete. Amen. Complete. Now the King James says thoroughly furnished. I like that thought because if you buy a house and someone says, oh, don't worry, the furniture's already inside. That's thoroughly furnished. Amen. <laughs> you go in and everything's in there that you need. It's like, wow, it's all there. Wouldn't it be wonderful if every time you did move, you didn't have to take your stuff with you. There was new stuff waiting for you in the new house. Think about it. <laughs> and it was even better than the stuff you leave behind, right? Um, new updated stuff. Well, that's the word of God for us. The Bible is never outdated. The Bible is always up to date. And if we live our lives by scripture and we conduct ourselves by the word of God, everything we need is in the word of God. It's complete. Uh, it's, and, and then we'll be equipped or fully equipped for every good work. Whatever that work is, the scripture supplies what we need in order to do that work. Amen? In other words, the scriptures will put the winds in your sails. Hallelujah. The scriptures will supply the energy you need in order to do what God says. Now, we go back now to the two things here. Um, the Lord, the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Let's look at that first one. Con converting the soul. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.15, we'll go back here. We're reading backwards, so you'll have to excuse me on that. Uh, those of you who are dyslexic, you're getting into this because I'm reading backwards. Amen? Right? And so we uh, joke about our issues, knowing that God's bigger than our issues. Amen? <laughs> um, so Paul writing to Timothy here, and understand this, that at this point, the New Testament had not yet been written. Um, Timothy was raised by a Jewish mother and a Jewish grandmother. But by all accounts, there's a strong hint that his father was a, was a Greek. In other words, he may not have even been a Christian. It's hard to tell. He, may not, he wasn't a Jew for sure. His father was a Greek. So he lived in a bit of a divided household. But the power of a praying mother, the power of a praying grandma here, who taught this young boy the scriptures from a very early age. And notice it says, And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. Timothy, you've been raised on the faith. You've been raised on the Hebrews 11 characters. Samson, David, Saul, all those people, some of them failures. But you've been raised on all of them and all these stories. And these stories, though, have power contained in them. These, these scriptures have power, um, authority in them. It, it, it's the word of God. And, and, and he says, these sacred writings that you have been familiar with, they are able, which are able to make you wise for salvation. So in other words, the scriptures have contained in and of themselves the ability to make you and I wise for salvation. Think about that. Isn't that awesome? Now, if you were like me, I didn't know a thing about God when I first came to the Bible. I didn't know nothing about God. But the Holy Spirit was superseding this whole event. Somebody has very wisely coined the phrase that the Bible is the only book that the author is always present when someone reads it. Amen? Think about that. This is why when I broke open the Bible, I'm, I'm schizo in my head, hearing voices in my head, but God supernaturally was there preventing the enemy from destroying my life and bringing me to a process of, of conviction of sin, repentance and salvation. And I have to look back and I say, thank God for that Bible. Amen? That someone brought into my home. It was a good news Bible. It had a rainbow on the front. It was yellow. And I'll be honest with you, it had sketches in it throughout the stories. And I thank God for those sketches. It was like a breather, like, thank God for the sketches. Looking for a window as I'm reading scripture. God knew I needed those sketches. Amen. 
And it was a good news Bible. Now, how many of you know the good news translation is not a great translation? Can God use a bad translation to convert you to himself? Absolutely. It was the only book I had. The only Bible I had. And God used that good news Bible to convert this soul right here. This messed up soul right here was converted by the power of the word of God, even in that faulty translation. Amen? God is bigger than faulty translations. Right? I think God knew my mind was so messed up. He's like, I'll, I'll just give him a good news Bible. That's about all he can handle at this point. Man, if it was the King James, I, I don't know. That would have taken a little longer for me, I think, at that moment in time. Though I thank God I read the King James, love the King James. I, you know, I'm learning that, you know, different Bibles out there, they're good for each individual. And uh, got a great respect for the history of the English Bible and its power upon um, English and American society, English-speaking society. Okay, so... Um, they're able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So uh, Paul writing to Timothy said, even the scriptures you had at that point, though there was no New Testament scriptures written, the scriptures you had, Old Testament, they were able, they had power in them to make you wise for salvation through faith. In other words, they could bring you to faith in Christ Jesus. So the goal of the scripture is to reveal Christ Jesus to us and bring us through to a faith in Christ Jesus. James 1.18, let's, let's go there. Why do we major on the Bible? I hope you're getting the gist of why we major on scripture. If you're a true believer in this place this morning, you may disagree with me, but let me warn you, you're going to have a much more difficult time disagreeing with scripture. Right? If you're a true believer, you may dislike what I have to say. But if I've got chapter and verse for it, and not just one chapter and verse, but multiple chapter and verses, then you're more inclined to have to receive it. It's like, man, I don't like it. But I've pledged to uh, live my life to God and put, 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 the, put, put my life under the authority of God's word, which means that sometimes there's going to be some correction. Um, this, the Word of God has authority like nothing else has. And uh, notice that the Word of God in James 1.18 is used as the source and the tool to instigate the new birth. Um, when we preach the gospel, we are inviting everyone to come to salvation. We have a whoever message. And that we are responsible for as the church we are responsible for giving the whoever message but we are not responsible for the specific message in other words the effectual message only God himself can give in other words when you're preaching the gospel and you're inviting all to come to salvation commanding people to come to repentance that there, there can be one soul that God the Holy Spirit is hitting and reaching that's God's work that's not me. That's not you. That's God's effectual working. We're not in control of that. We have to preach the message, but it's only God who can specifically call the individual in an effective, effectual way. You with me on that? And we trust that God is working with us as we go forth and share his word. The Lord working with them, confirming the word. Um, but so let's read this, uh, James 1.18, of his own will. Who is this referring to? The Father, right? The Father, of his own will, he brought us forth uh, by the word of truth. So we could see what he used. He uses the word of truth. It was by the word of truth that he brought you and me forth into this new creation reality. That we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So God did a second work in us. By the word of God. You've heard it said you must be born again. We were born once. And we owe our first existence to God. When we were brought into the earth. 
But we also owe our second creation to God, the second birth. And that was performed by the word of God. 1 Peter 1, 23. Let's go there. Know this how Peter takes the natural birth and he talks about the natural seed that produced the natural birth and then he compares it again with second birth, second seed, supernatural seed, causing a supernatural birth. And he talks about being born again. He says, since you have been born again, born once, we must be born again. Not of perishable seed, that was the first birth, but of imperishable, that which will not perish uh, through the living and abiding word of God. This is why we preach God's word. Because it is only the word of God that can perform this supernatural birth in the listener and in the hearer. And only the word of God can build up and edify the soul that has been converted and that has been saved. Um, now we go now to the second point though, and we go to the reviving the soul or restoring the soul. It won't take too long where as a Christian, you have had the joys of the Lord. You've experienced the wonderful times with the Lord. And then you go through those dry seasons, those difficult seasons, those seasons where it seems God is far away. And uh, this is where we find comfort and hope in the scriptures. If you turn with me to Romans 15 verse 4. You see, we are called to find our connection with God primarily through the scriptures. The scriptures are our primary source for our connection with God. And so the neglect of scriptures is often what causes a falling away in the believer's life. Not an entire falling away, thank God, because he's faithful to keep us by his power. But the lowering of the flame, where things don't quite burn so bright as they once did. And you can trace it back to the neglect of scripture. But Romans 15 verse 4, and I love the King James Version here, because the term comfort means a lot to me. And uh, as I'm sure it means a lot to you. It says, for whatsoever things were written before time, or previously, were written for our learning. So in other words, they were written for us. Genesis, Deuteronomy, and all those books, they were written to a people in a specific time period in history. There's a definite historical time frame when those books were written and there were people alive who they were written to, but the, they were written for us as well, right? When these words were written, Moses didn't know who you were, but the Holy Spirit in Moses knew who you were, and Genesis was written for you, even if it wasn't written to you at the time. You see, there's two authors, really speaking in a source sense. You have human channels, but there's one divine author that supersedes all of Scripture. And as he's causing Scripture to be written, it was written for you and me. Who are 2,000 years removed from the events that happened to Jesus Christ. But he caused it to be written for you and me. How do we know? Well, look at this. For whatsoever things were written before time were written for our learning, you and me, that we, through patience. How many of you have Bibles that say perseverance? How many of you know perseverance is a challenge sometimes, isn't it? Perseverance means you keep going when you don't feel like going. But where do we find that strength to keep going? It's the Word of God, isn't it? It's the promises of God in the Word. Um, the most comforting verse that I've ever read in my life is, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. 
it's a great promise and uh, it's a promise that sustained me in hour of need that he will never leave me nor forsake me it's a promise that's comforted me when I've seen believers stumble and fall and I've seen believers seemingly fall away true believers now I understand there are professing believers who do fall away and never to return I understand that too but a true believer that's been foreknown of God from all eternity ultimately they will not lose their salvation if you think that can happen then salvation is more in your hands instead of his and I'll pray for you that's very difficult um, and make no mistake our belief changes over time as we get more into the Word of God there's things I used to believe that I don't believe anymore all because of the transformative power of Scripture you know what I'm saying so if I preach something this morning that disagrees with your doctrine check it out with Scripture itself and um, I'm human I make mistakes but I try to live and preach by the Word of God though I don't do it perfectly um, but the Bible is the final authority and if I'm wrong show me in Scripture if you're wrong then may I show you in Scripture as well that's the authority the Scripture not me not you Scripture is the final authority check out what I'm saying with Scripture itself and uh, you know if I'm not speaking according to Scripture then reject it instantly because I have no authority apart from Scripture itself nothing I have no advantage to you we are both relying on the same God the same Lord the same blood the same cross and we are both trying to understand the same Word of God and trusting in it and trusting in the God who gave it it's by grace and grace alone I don't have anything extra to you um, maybe I've just been in it a bit longer than you but still you know, I'm, I'm drawing you to the sources I'm trusting in don't trust in yourself trust in Christ trust in his word trust in his promises and live by his grace as much as you're able by the word of God um, that we through endurance and patience and comfort of the scriptures how often has God used his scriptures to comfort your soul how often uh, the word comfort in the Greek means speaking closely to someone there are times in our life that we can say God you know my name and address because that verse was just for me it's like thank you Lord one of the verses I've loved over the years doing uh, especially in my college days I have been young now I'm old but I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging for bread that's a good promise right there um, comfort of the scriptures the scriptures comfort us thank God for the comforting power of the Word of God amen I have a family member right now who lives in England I've been sharing with this person the comforting power of the scriptures and I think she said that they've been sustaining her in hour of need and um, the Word of God is supernatural but notice through the comfort or through the patience and comfort of the scriptures we might have hope we have hope this morning don't we in our trials um, Psalm 27 I don't have it on screen but I would have fainted if I had not believed to see the goodness of God in the land of the living what a beautiful promise that is now the reason why I'm trying to convince you this morning of the infallibility of the Word of God is because we need a reliable trustworthy source for truth at the end of the day if everything is uncertain if everything is is unsure where are we gonna go what are we gonna put our trust in the testimonies of different people in this place were like I couldn't come to God till I finally found that the Bible is actually trustworthy and what I'd been told about the Bible in school simply wasn't true Romans 10:17. Romans 
My friend, if you believe the Bible is God's word, and you believe the Bible is God speaking, then you can trust what's spoken in that book like nothing else. And I don't know how I came to this reality. Looking back, I could say it was the Holy Spirit. But at the time, that word of God supernaturally basically imposed itself on my life. And it put a faith where there was no faith. And I look back and I say, that had to be the Holy Spirit. But oh, my friend, nothing else can produce faith in your life like the word of God. Romans 10, 17, the King James Version says, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. You can put your trust in the word of God more than you can put your trust in the word of anyone else. The word of God. God is not a man that he should lie. Has he spoken and will he not do it? Has he not said and will he not make it good? Not one of his words will fall to the ground. Not one of God's words will fail. None of his words can be broken. Jesus himself says, Scripture cannot be broken. You've got something in your hands that's unbreakable, trustworthy, reliable. Now, the modern translations slightly change the wording, and they go off different Greek manuscripts. Yeah, there are Greek, Greek uh, variants, you might say. Uh, but I tell you what, I don't mind this either. It says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. There's different ways you can look at this. Number one, you can look at it and say, okay, you hear about Christ and faith enters your heart and you're saved. I guess that would fit the context. However, I think it's a little more than that. I think what that's referring to is, is that Christ himself calls you through his word to salvation. Amen? In other words, you hear God speak to you somehow through, um, through the word of God. Now, you'll have to excuse me. My slides aren't really in great form this morning. But the Bible talks about how... So, so, so just in passing, we have the perfection of the scriptures, number one. The scriptures have the power to convert the soul, number two. Uh, number three. The scriptures have the power to revive and restore the soul. And number four, the certainty and confidence we can have in the scriptures. Now the fifth point here is that you and I, we might be simple folk, simple people, right? I, I'm, I've never been an intellect. I've never been a great intellectual. But you know what? I found a wisdom in the word of God that I found no place else. And the word of God can give us a wisdom that's not of this age, not of this world, but it's a wisdom that begins with the fear of the Lord. And it's a wisdom that is God-given, a godly wisdom. I'll be honest with you, since I became a believer, my carpentry hasn't, hasn't improved one iota. I'm still very bad at carpentry work, and I think that's my lot in life. Um, I'm still not a very good mechanic. Uh, I, I'm still really foolish when it comes to those things. But you know what? I have a wisdom I didn't have before, and I can't brag about it. It's a God-given wisdom, and it's a wisdom that Scripture itself has given me. And uh, we can have that uh, through the Scriptures. The Scriptures have the power and the ability to take a simple person and to make him wise in the ways of God supernaturally they have the power to transform the mind they have the power to take the mind of a schizophrenic give him a mind of peace renew his mind transform his mind and fill his mind with the word of god the word of god has power like nothing else has and your mind was created to think about god you realize that number one is to think about god what's what's the greatest commandment you will love the lord your god with all your what heart mind soul and strength I used to think, lose your mind. That gets you into trouble when you do that. Just go off emotion. Nope, don't want to do that. Um, the Word of God has the power and the ability to take a simple person and to communicate 
and teach that person who God is in a very powerful way. Psalm 119, verse 130. I'm, I'm, I'm coming into the finishing line here, guys, so bear with me. The finishing line is imminent. I'm coming close to it. And, uh, but uh, Psalm 119, verse 130, um, the King James says, The entrance of thy word bring a forth light. Uh, and, and it truly does. But I believe the entrance of God's word, um, Psalm 119, verse 130, uh, should be the unfolding of your words gives light. In other words, understanding his words. These words being unfolded to us, made open to us. And it's the Holy Spirit that does that. He's our teacher. He teaches us. He unfolds the words of God to us. It gives light. But notice this. The words of God through the Holy Spirit and his work, it imparts understanding to who? To the smart, to the wise, to the simple. Amen. And, uh, and that's encouraging for me. And as I hope it's encouraging for all of us, that God doesn't just take the great intellect and say, hey, I'm going to do something through him. He can take the simpleton and do great things for the simple person. Amen. And give you a wisdom beyond this age. Now, the Holy Spirit. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Holy Spirit is the one who sent into the heart of the believer to perform the work of new birth, regeneration, but he's also sent into our heart to teach us in the ways of God, to break open scripture to us. Think about this, that you have the scriptures in front of you and you have the author of those very scriptures living in you. Consider that. The author is present when we read it. If we're seeking salvation, he's present in a convicting sense so he doesn't yet live in us. But as a believer, he lives in us. And as we break open his word, we are breaking open something that's been breathed out by the very one who lives in you and me. Now, John 16, 12. We'll go here real quick. Jesus said to his disciples back then, he says, I still have many things to say to you. Oh, what Jesus had to say. Do you realize the many things that Jesus had to say to his disciples is our New Testament. Do you realize that? What we now call the New Testament is what Jesus wanted to say to his disciples. And we have it on record what they could not grasp right away until the Holy Spirit came into their heart and life at Pentecost. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. In other words, we need God to help us to understand the Bible. We need God's help to help us understand Scripture. If we go to these Scriptures thinking we're smart and we're intelligent, the book will remain close to you and me. We may have a certain understanding of it, but we certainly will not enter into the true spirit of it. Right? We need the Holy Spirit. Without the Spirit of God, we cannot be saved. We cannot understand the Bible. We cannot enter in to the reality of Scripture. We cannot understand the words of Jesus. We cannot grasp them. But the New Testament is what's been written since the Spirit was given. And what Jesus wanted to say has now been recorded for us in Holy Scripture. Consider that for a moment. And Jesus says this. We're not alone here. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Is that written for us too? Hallelujah. It is indeed. We need a guide. And we don't just need any guide. We need the divine guide, the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth. We're living in a day today when people are claiming to be led by the spirit but you know what? We know they're not led by the Spirit because they've laid aside the Holy Scriptures. If you're led by the Spirit, you will never, ever lay aside the Holy Scriptures. But you will walk in step with the Scriptures as you are walking in step with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit and the Word are in unanimous agreement and you will love the Word, the word of God more, not less, if you are Spirit-filled. Amen? 
Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. One of the mistakes that happens very often is we major so much on the Holy Spirit, we uh, forget who Jesus is, and um, we forget what Jesus has done, and yet here we see clearly he will not speak of himself, but he'll point us to Christ. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Now here um, in the next verse it says, He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. He is the one who releases into our soul all the realities that Jesus Christ has purchased for you and me on the cross and by his resurrection. He puts new life into us, forgiveness of sins into us, a perfect righteousness into us, and from a positional sense, he gives us all of these marvelous gifts that are ours in Christ Jesus. And he goes on to say, and I tell you what, we don't know the half yet. We are called to grow in this grace. All things that the Father has a mind. What does that cover? Man, and I tell you what, we don't know the half of what, of what Jesus has purchased for us at the cross. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. Marvelous. Marvelous. Now, consider this. Thank God for the Bible. We'd be lost without it. But let's also thank God for the Holy Spirit who gives us understanding of the Bible. Amen? Because without Him, there is no new life, no new birth, no understanding of Scripture, no, no study of this new life God's given to us. Because as wild as your imagination is, you could never understand what God has prepared. Let's go here, the final verses here. Um, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9. Let's go there. Human beings could not enter into this without God revealing it. We need God, and we need him to help us with this, as it says clearly in 1 Corinthians 2.9. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. We need the Holy Spirit to show us these things. And we need the Holy Spirit to break open the Scriptures for us. As we read his Bible, we need the Spirit's help. Otherwise, it's not entered into our heart at all, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. But aren't you glad it doesn't stop there? If it just stopped there, guess what? We're cut off. We can't enter in. We can't know any of this. But know this, it doesn't stop there. Final Scripture. But God has revealed them to who? To us. Amen. Isn't that awesome? But God has revealed them to us, believers. How's he done it? Through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. Isn't that awesome? Who can know the things of a man's spirit? except a man's spirit within him. In the same way, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. And yet he lives in you and me. So in concluding here, number one, we must go to the right source. Go to the Bible. It won't fail you in hour of need. Um, in our application, we're dedicated to giving you God's word here at the church as well, from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, here in this ministry, we're dedicated to doing that, whether it's me or someone else that's uh, ministering. We try with all our heart to give you the word of God from Genesis to Revelation. Now, the key is, will you also commit your life to the authority and to the study of the scriptures yourself? Because nothing can replace that personal thing, too. We need a corporate thing together. But the personal conviction, and I'll be honest with you guys, I need to renew my commitment to this regularly, <laughs> right? It's like, okay, I need to come back to Scripture again, come back to the Word of God, and devote my life to it. And I reckon you're the same as me. You have moments where you're in the Word beautifully and moments when you're not in the Word like you should. Well, we recommit ourselves, we persevere with it. And my friend, stay in the Word of God. It won't fail you. Let's stand and let's pray. Hallelujah. 
Father, we thank you today for the gift of the Word of God. Uh, we thank you today for the gift of the Bible. We also thank you for your Holy Spirit, the free gift of your Holy Spirit. And Father, we ask that um, you would just inflame our hearts to know you more, to know your Word more, and that as we read it, you might break it open to us and... Uh, Help us, Lord, to become more and more in these days a people of, people of your book, a people of your word. And Father, may you bless this afternoon as we go forth uh, sharing your word with others and sharing Bibles with others. And, and uh, may you remind those uh, to pray, Lord, as we do go forth and that hearts would be touched and changed and pre-prepared uh, by your Holy Spirit. Uh, have your way this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as we close, guys, if anyone needs prayer, I'd love to pray with you for anything. God bless.